But we have been going through the Gospel of Matthew, and so I just want to recap what we have been talking about. But first, I want to ask, have you been enjoying so far us going through the book of Matthew? Raise your hand if you have been enjoying it. Okay, Pastor Mario asked me to take notes of those who didn't, so if you didn't raise your hand, I got you. Um, But in all seriousness, uh, I think it's very important that as a church together, as we walk through uh, one of uh, a book in the Bible, that you as the congregation and all of us together, we are going home and reading along as we are continuing the, in this series. So if you haven't already, I know some of you got some new Bibles last week. I was a little jealous. I'm not going to lie. For those of you that received new Bibles, I wanted to raise my hand because I wanted a new Bible. But this is a perfect opportunity for you to crack open your Bible and and, and read the Gospel of Matthew. We're only in chapter 3, so you only have two chapters uh, to catch up. Um, so if you want to read that right now while I'm talking, hey, go for it. Um, but I will say chapter 1 is going to be uh, a lot for you to go through. So in chapter 1, we read about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And I was one of those people when Pastor Mario told me he was going to uh, read through the genealogy. I was like, bro, how are you even going to do that? If you have not read, it's just a bunch of names. And I'm like, I don't understand what you're going to get out of that. But what we saw and what we were able to see is that God used many people. There's, there's people in that genealogy that we, that we learn about in the Old Testament that God used. Ordinary people, right? People, some people who were counted out in their lives. Some people who were never thought of of anything. God used those people. And so that's what we learned in week one. Week two, we talked about the birth of Jesus Christ. And although it's not Christmas time, um, we learned about the wise men and, and the, uh, the gifts that they brought to to Jesus, and they understood, and what they did was, as soon as they brought these gifts, they worshiped. So Pastor Mario talked about worship last week. And so this week, we're going to be in chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at the story of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus Christ. But before I get started, I want to pray one more time so that God just opens up our hearts. Father, we thank you for this time that you give us to be here and just hear from your word. Father, as I am up here, I pray that you just use me, Lord, to speak to your people. Father, I I pray that I not take anything away from your word, Lord, but I stick to what your word is saying, and I pray that um, in this time that the hearts that are in here are ready to receive. For those that are in here in person and watching online, Father, I thank you. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name that I pray. Amen. So there are three words that we can apply from today's message. So there's three words. So if you want to write this down somewhere uh, in your journal or in your Bible, there are three words that we can apply from the text today. Those three words are repentance, humility, and acknowledgement. Say it with me. Repentance, humility, and acknowledgement. All right, great. Great. All right, that's it. No, I'm joking. Um, But those are the three words today, and we're going to talk a little bit about those words as we go on. So we'll begin in Matthew chapter 3, verse uh, verse 1, and it says here, In those days, John the Baptist. So real quick, so just some quick context. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, his kinfolk, his primo, however you want to say it, his kinsman. This is Jesus' cousin, all right? So if you read in another gospel, I don't, I'm not sure if it's in the uh, gospel of Luke, Mark, or John, but it talks a little bit about uh, Mary and Elizabeth. Elizabeth being Mary's sister, that they were both pregnant at the same time. John was in one womb, and Jesus was in, in the other womb. And so, again, they're, they're cousins, so I just want you to understand, as we're talking about John, uh, this is Jesus' cousin, just so that that way you know who he is, because he kind of just pops out of nowhere here. It's just Matthew goes from the genealogy to the birth of Jesus, and then John the Baptist, and we're like, okay, where did this guy come from? Well, we learn a little bit more about him in other Gospels, so just for some context, that's who he is. So it says here, he came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and he said this, And this is how I feel like he said it, so if I get a little loud, but he said this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this was he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now John wore garment of wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. 
Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, Jordan confessing their sin. So this first word, repentance, right? John the Baptist, was. this is what he was preaching, repentance. And what he was doing, we read about him in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. It says that he was making the way for the Lord to come. And so this is what the, um, why we read right here in verse, in verse 2 or verse 3 about the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. This is talking about John. And so Matthew wants you to know that and understand that. So we learn, again, that John was spoken about in the book of Isaiah as the one who will prepare the way of the Lord. And you see, not many people understood the signs and the wonders that were happening leading up to Jesus' coming. Only very few did. As we read, the wise men, there were some of those very few who knew that the Messiah was here. You see, the reason... Right, John was preaching repentance was because he knew that many people's hearts were far from God, even though that he was very near. So he understood this, and this is why he was preaching this repent. He was asking the people of God to repent because there were many people who really believed they were so close to God, many religious leaders of this time who believed they were so close to God, but they were yet so far. And John understood this. See, in a commentary, in John MacArthur's commentary, it says this about the word repentance. It says, the message of John was proclaimed, that John proclaimed was so simple, so simple that it could be summarized in one word, repent. See, in the Greek, repent means more than a regret or sorrow. It means to turn around and to change direction and to change the mind and will. I'll be very honest with you. Repentance is, is hard, but it is possible. And here's why I say that. You see, whenever I was a youth, um, just a little bit about my testimony. I was a very rebellious kid, did a, drugs, tried to sell drugs, um, went to jail. I liked breaking into people's cars. <laughs> Sorry, I, I laugh at that part, but it was true. I just liked it. I don't know what was wrong with me. I was just crazy. <laughs> but aside from all that, something that I always struggled with that nobody knew was I struggled with pornography. Nobody knew. I was very embarrassed of this, as many people are, right? Or, I don't know, today's world is very different. But I was very embarrassed. See, I, my friends and, and, you know, my youth pastor knew that I had this rebellious, like, person in me, but they didn't know what I really struggled with. And so there was one day, uh, um, we went to this conference, and I was, like, the, the guy that was up there, he, he, said, he just said the word, he said pornography. And for some reason, my eyes just lit up and looked at him. And he talked about how it was something that was sinful. And although I knew about it, and I knew it was something that I didn't want under other people to know, I didn't realize the effect that it had on my life. And so I remember we came back that Sunday, and I was feeling God just, uh, like just working in me and asking for me to repent from this, which I didn't even know like really uh, and understand how to, but I was just like, I need to tell somebody. So I remember asking my youth pastor, Raymond Hernandez, who's up here, and I pulled him aside, and I was like, hey, I, I just need to talk to you. I got to tell you something. But nobody could be in the room. And so he was like, okay. And so uh, he shuts the door, right? It takes a little bit for all the students to get out. He shuts the door, and I sit down. And immediately, the, the moment I hit that chair, tears, like a waterfall. I was like just crying. Like I, and I, I couldn't get the words to come out. And he was like, what's wrong? Like, you know? And I was like, I, I've been struggling with like pornography for a very long time and I've never told anybody about it. And I remember him just looking at me and of course I, 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 it's very, I, I can't put together just after that what happened. I, I know he prayed for me and we talked about it. But here's the thing that happened from there is although I felt like this weight was lifted off my shoulders and I felt that, okay, I, I told somebody about it and I, I, I told God that I was sorry for it, really my heart didn't change one bit. 
because I continued to struggle with this addiction that I had for a very long time, even to the point when ever Alondra, my wife, and I were about to get married, two weeks before we got married, I confessed to her, I was like, hey, we watched this movie, it was called Prayer Room, and it convicted me as I was watching it, and I remember we got out the movies two weeks before our wedding, I'm like, hey, I've been struggling with this, and I've never told you about it, and she's like, well, I thought you were good for me, I was like, no, like, I'm struggling with it, to the point where I continue to struggle with it in, in the beginning of our marriage, and see, when we look at the word repentance, it doesn't mean, as it says in the Greek, it's not a regret or sorrow, but it means that you turn around and change directions. And this is what John was preaching. He was asking the people to repent, to change their ways, to turn directions. And see, what I was doing whenever I was struggling with this, most of the time I was make, trying to make God feel sorry for me. There was nothing in my heart that ever changed. It wasn't until I met with a brother in Christ one day, and I was like, I just have went through every avenue. I tried deleting apps. I tried deleting my internet. I tried doing all these things, but nothing's working. And he told me, you want me to tell you what's, what you're not doing? Is you're not really allowing God to really take this away from you. You're trying to figure everything out on your own. You're the one that's trying to do this, but it's not up to you. <laughs> See, again, repentance means a change of direction. It wasn't until I really changed the direction of how I was looking. See, doing a 180 is turning the other way, but what I was doing is a 360. I just kept going and, and going back in the same direction. And again, John was preaching this to the people of that time. Why? Because he understood his purpose was to prepare the way for the Messiah, that there was going to be one to come to, prepare, to be here to die for us but he was trying to prepare their hearts. Just as every Sunday, every single Sunday, we share the gospel with you. Why? Because we believe and we know and we trust that God has made a way already for you to come and to repent and to change your life around and to follow him. And like I said, it's hard. It is. I get it. I, I, I mean, just because i Stop struggling with that doesn't mean there's something else that I struggle with. There's multiple things, but the thing is, I'm, I'm slowly but surely just asking God every day, okay, God, like, I don't want to go in this direction no more, but I want to go in this direction. And that is the same thing for you, church family. As we share the gospel every Sunday, we should be examining our hearts and asking ourselves, are we really repenting? for our sins? Are we really changing directions or are we just continuing in the same cycle over and over again? See, as I mentioned earlier, I was trying to make God feel sorry for me rather than really change my life for him because there's a difference. I can make you feel sorry for me by me telling you all these stories, but what good is it if I never change the, the things that I do? Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 says this, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what's happening here? John is baptizing people, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, who are the religious leaders of this time, are coming. And they're, they're trying to see what's going on because a lot, like their world is about to be changed. Because what they feel that they've been doing is the right thing they're doing is actually the wrong thing. They feel like they're better than other people, and they presume to walk in that way. And so John knew that, right? As he's seen them, he kind of, I mean, it says you brood of vipers, but I don't know if he threw a little cuss word in there or not. I mean, this is probably just the PG version of what he probably told them, I like to believe. But he understood that they weren't coming for true repentance, that they were coming to see what was going on and what was about to change and why John was preaching repentance and why he wasn't telling people to follow Abraham because that's what they believed. This is why John told them that even God can make, or that he told them this. He said, even God is able to raise from these stones 
to raise up children from Abraham because for them it was all about being from the line of Abraham or the line of Moses. It wasn't really about being God's people. And he understood that. So he, of course, kind of tells them like to get out of here. And then the funny thing about the Pharisees and Sadducees is they didn't really get along with each other. So they came together as one people to come and see what was going on, but they really didn't like agree eye to eye. But whenever it came to this, they knew, again, something was about to change. In verse 11, John continues and he says this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. So again, as we read earlier, John is here. He's understanding his purpose in life. He understands that the Messiah is coming, and he knows that there is somebody greater than him that is coming. So in verse 13, again, we went from baby Jesus to Jesus as an adult now. So baby Jesus, Jesus as an adult, because right here, Jesus enters the scene. It says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to, to John to be baptized by him. But John would, pre would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me? See, John had a clear understanding of his purpose in life. And he didn't take advantage of the multitudes of people that were coming to him. If you ask me, John showed humility, right? Imagine John, people are just coming to him from different regions to be baptized by John the Baptist. But he understood, right? Because what did he say? He's there, somebody's coming that is greater than I. Jesus comes and he's like, hey, uh, baptize me, John. And John's like, no, 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 no. I need to be baptized by you. See, in today's culture and world, it's all about being famous. Well, at least that's the way I see it. It's all about being known in, in the things that you do. And I, I feel that John could have taken advantage of that because people knew who he was. Even Jesus knew who he was. All right, he knows all of us, but he addressed him as John. Hey, baptize me. He came to him where he was at. He didn't ask John to go to him. He came to be baptized by John. And again, John, in his humility, understood that there was one greater. And before his eyes, he's there. See, instead, he knew, John knew his calling, that he was to prepare the way for the Lord and even as Jesus asked to be baptized by John, he seemingly felt unworthy to baptize Jesus and instead asked Jesus to baptize him. See, the next word that I said that we could apply to our lives is humility. This is what humility means. And this is a, um, from the, the internet browser, so it's not the exact dictionary, Webster dictionary word, but it says this. An ad uh, humility is an attitude of spiritual modesty that comes from the understanding of our place in the larger order of things. Again, John understood his purpose in life. He understood that he was just there to prepare the way. Because when we read in other translations, people were even crowning uh, John as the Messiah. They were saying, hey, you're the Messiah. John's like, no, 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 you got it all wrong. See, because these people were ready People were ready for the Messiah to be here already. So they were just looking for anything, any sign that, and anybody who they could just crown as king. But again, John, in his humility, understood who he was and the place that he held in the gospel. See, as we read John, as we read about John, he understood that God's people needed a savior and that he was just there to prepare the way. Even Jesus himself shows the ultimate humility. Here's why, right? Jesus 
Think about this. Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. He was sinless in his being. There was no sin in him. Do you think he needed any repentance? No. Do you think he ever committed any sins? No. But in his humility, he came again and he asked John to be baptized by him. And here's the reason that he did that. He did that to identify with us. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus came on this earth to identify with us as humans? I always tell my students this. I'm like, Jesus had to go to the restroom. Jesus had to use the number two and the number one. Jesus probably got sick, but he probably healed himself right then and there. We don't get no context of that, but he did. He was a 100% man and 100% God. And this is why whenever we come to church and we hear about Jesus and it impacts our heart because we, we know and we serve a Savior who is able to relate with us, somebody who came from heaven to earth to relate with you and everybody in here and your families and your friends and everybody. So for one second, don't ever think that you are alone in this world. Don't ever think that you are walking alone in this world or walking by yourself because we have a Savior who came to identify with us. Verse 15 says this, but Jesus answered him, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So again, Jesus here is continuing in this baptism. And he tells John, hey, we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and, G and when Jesus was baptized, immediately, this is important, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said this, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The Messiah is here. This is where we are in the story. He is now revealing to everybody that he is here. See, this baptism was unlike any other baptism in the history of histories of histories. See, whenever we have Baptism Sunday, it, it gets pretty packed in here. There's multiple people come. We celebrate, and, you know, it, it's amazing. Now, Jesus' baptism, I don't think we could fit how many people could, would be there. I, I mean, it doesn't say how many people were there, but, I mean, I could just imagine if Jesus was to get baptized in here, we wouldn't have enough room for, for anybody. Right, you would be having a call. I'd be selling tickets or whatever. I'd be like, hey, you want to come to Jesus' baptism? I'm joking. <laughs> but we, again, we see that this is a, a baptism un, unlike any other. And, and I'll explain why. But whenever I was, I, I talk with my wife before I share, like I share with her my sermon. She basically hears my sermon like five times in one week. Because she asked me about it and I'm like telling her about it. And then like we're going back. And then she, she also like helps me just push through some things and understand. And so whenever we were talking about the baptism of Jesus, I was like, man, this was like, like, could you imagine just being there? She's like, yeah, it's like an extraordinary baptism. So if you didn't get that, our vision here is we are ordinary people living extraordinary lives by following Jesus. See, we are just ordinary people in this world. There's nobody greater, but the extraordinary one is Jesus. And so this is what made it such an extraordinary baptism is, is it was the baptism of the Messiah who needed, again, to repent of nothing. He was sinless, but he did it to identify with us. But not only that, he did it as a foreshadowing of what was to come in his death, burial, and resurrection. Again, when it said he immediately rose up, that was an allusion to how he was going to resurrect. See, whenever we baptize you, you are putting off the old self and coming up new. But why? Because of what happened on the cross. See, John here, the, the last word that we can uh, apply to our lives is acknowledgement. See, John acknowledged Jesus as Savior. 
See, God before everyone acknowledged Jesus as his son. John prepared the way for the Messiah, as we read earlier, but now through this passage we can see that Jesus is the way. So John prepared the way, but Jesus is the way. Like that song, Waymaker. This is the Waymaker coming. This is him who are, we are reading about. This is Jesus, the one who is here to make a way in your life. Even when you don't see it, he is going to make a way in your life. Trust me, we read about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, about the people. They weren't just these nice and, and, you know, people who came suited up and were all like the best people. No, these were just ordinary people that God used. See, what Jesus displayed in his baptism, again, I'll, I'll reiterate this, is that he what he was, uh, what was what what was to come in his death, burial, and resurrection? See, there was again no need for Jesus to be baptized, but he did it to fulfill all righteousness. And here is how we kind of connect everything together. See, and John again, we go back. John was preaching repentance because in his own life, again, we read about John's humility. We read about what he was preaching, but in his own life, he acknowledged Jesus as Savior. And my question to you, and this will be a question that gets asked every Sunday, is have you really acknowledged Jesus as your Savior? See, when we follow Christ, the first word that we talked about, we repent for our sins, meaning we completely change the direction Change directions from our sin. See, this is something that will follow as you continue in your relationship with Christ. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's something that isn't easy to just automatically turn around and change, but it is something that is possible. That has, there has been a way made for you to come and come out of your sins. See, and, and your heart will be completely transformed, and you will no longer want to go back to your old ways. The second thing is we, we, when we follow Christ, we strive for humility. Understanding that we follow in, the, in Christ's footsteps as he showed his humility by dying for us on the cross. So the first thing is as believers in Christ, we repent for our sins. The second thing is we strive for humility. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For the Son of Man came not, came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so we follow in that same footsteps in showing humility. And again, I've always heard this, but if you say that you're humble and you gotta say that out loud, are you really humble? No, right? I mean, that's just a saying that goes. But humility comes just in, sometimes people won't see the work that we do. I mean, some of you may have that one coworker or that one person that is very quiet, comes to work, clocks in, and nobody ever hears. They never boast about how much money they make. They never boast in the things that they wear, but they just come to work. And that might be you today. They just come, work hard, hum and show just their humility in what they do. And it is the same thing that we're called to do as followers of Christ, is show that humility in the things that we do. That means when people cut us off on the freeway, don't say nothing, right? <laughs> say it in your mind. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Don't roll your window down. <laughs> just, I mean, there's countless of things that I can name, but I mean, it really comes again with you just, whenever you follow Christ, repentance comes with it, and you want to change that direction. The things, your old ways and the things that you used to do no longer feel good inside of you. You're like, man, why am I doing this? And then the last thing is we follow, when we follow Christ, we acknowledge him as Savior. So the first thing, we, when we follow Christ, we repent for our sins. This was the message that John was preaching of repentance. The second thing is when we follow Christ, we strive for humility. And the last thing, when we follow Christ, of course, you have to acknowledge him as Savior of your life. That means that every other idol in your life or whoever you hold on this pedestal comes down and Jesus takes that place and never gets replaced in that, in your life. And I know there's some of you in here this morning who have probably never taken that step or never acknowledged 
Jesus as Savior. Or maybe there's some of you in here who have acknowledged Jesus as Savior, but maybe you're having a hard time repenting. Or maybe there's some of you in here who have, are, you have repented for your sins and you acknowledge Jesus as Savior, and you're having a hard time showing some humility in your life. See, I, I wanna pray for you in that way this morning because I believe that in, in each one of these words that we learn about repentance, humility, and acknowledgement, I would say that at least one of us in here is struggling with those things, whether we want to admit it or not. I'll be honest. I was ha- I, whenever I was preparing for this message, and I usually come and I practice uh, here on this stage, there's nobody in here. Whenever I stepped in through that door, I was like, God, like I, I'm, I'm preaching on repentance, and there, there's just something in my heart that is just stopping me from just, like, I, I, I just didn't feel good about what I was, like, about to talk about. Here's why, right? The, the Word of God, it says, it's a double-edged sword. As it's piercing your heart, it's also piercing my heart. So whenever I came into this building to practice, I walked through those doors, and I immediately, immediately just felt God saying, there's some things you need to repent for in your life. And I was like, God, like, I, I, I'm okay. And immediately, I just, I was trying to battle with myself in my mind, and I was like, shut up, right? Like, I was trying to tell myself to be quiet because I knew that I was dealing with this unrepented heart. There was something in my life that just wasn't sitting well with me. And what that was, I was just struggling with just my thoughts and where I was and if I was really being used by God. And maybe you feel like that this morning. And again, maybe you feel that there's something that has been stopping you from really pursuing that, that re- repentance with God and, and really saying, God, you know, I, I want to change the direction of my life. I don't want to go back to my old ways. Again, or maybe it's humility. Maybe some of you have felt really proud of the things that you have accomplished in your life and haven't acknowledged Jesus as Savior of your life. And so at this time, I just want to ask, if, if that is you, I just want everybody to close their eyes and just right now, in this moment, I'm not going to ask for you to come up here, but in your chair, if that is you and you feel that you are struggling, if there's something in your heart that you feel that you haven't brought to God and you haven't um, repented for, or if there's some humility that needs to happen in your life, or the last thing is if you've never acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Savior, I wanna pray for you this morning in that way. As we have read through this text, and I don't wanna get away from the fact that, that this what we're reading today has already happened. Jesus, John the Baptist has already prepared the way and Jesus already has made the way. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and come to him. And so I just wanna ask again, if that is you, just close your eyes. And as I am praying, I just want you to to be real with God and say, God, right now I'm, I'm struggling with this. God, I've been a little bit too proud of my accomplishments lately. I need some humility in my life. Or God, I just, honestly, I came this morning and I didn't really believe in anything or I didn't trust you, but I want to acknowledge you as Savior of my life this morning. Father, we come before you, Lord, and God, you hear your people, Lord. You hear their hearts, and I pray that at this time, Your people are not afraid to come to you, God. They're not afraid to be real with you. You are a loving God who came to this earth to identify with us so that we could have a way to you, God. And I pray that my brothers and sisters in Christ that are in here that are asking for repentance, that they change the direction of their life. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are in here who are asking for some humility in their life. And also, Lord, I want to lift up those who don't know you, who want to know you, God, and who today will acknowledge you as Savior of their life. So, God, I I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ, my family that is here before me, and I plead with them, God, 
and I ask that you hear us. But not only that, Father, I pray that we understand in our lives that when we follow you, God, we have to really trust you and we have to be real with you and we have to have an intimate relationship with you, God. And we have to love you above all else. Every human being, every materialistic thing that we own, above that, God, we have to love you above all things. Father, I thank you again, once again, for who you are. I thank you for preparing the way through John the Baptist, but ultimately making the way, coming as the Messiah of this world. And so, God, I thank you for who you are. We give you all the honor and glory in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.